It was another drama-filled and exciting weekend of Formula One action as Max Verstappen secured his second straight French Grand Prix victory. Charles Leclerc let another 25 points slip through his fingers while his teammate Carlos Sainz was left questioning Ferrari's strategy once again. Mercedes sees its first double podium after a sneaky restart by George Russell, and there's only one more week of racing before the summer break. All this and more on Unlap. I can't really see Leclerc getting back into this championship. Can we say that Alpine is officially the fourth best team in Formula One right now? Is he really going to drop the ball that many times? Is Red Bull going to drop the ball that many times? You'd never hear Max or Lewis make that kind of comment. Welcome to the Unlapped ESPN F1 show. I'm Katie George. He's Nate Saunders. He's Lawrence Edmondson. And we're here to break down everything that happened this past weekend and get you ready for the next circuit on the calendar, the Hungaro Ring. Both of you look well, maybe a little bronze even, Lawrence. I see that you survived the heat. It's great to see you both. Uh, Lawrence, you don't look like you're in your home living room. Where are you? I'm not. Uh, I'm in Zurich train station. So it turns out it's actually quite difficult to get from Marseille, which is the local big city next to uh, the Circuit Paul Card, over to Budapest, which of course is where I'm going for this weekend's race. Uh, so I looked at my options and the best one I could come up with, and also probably the most fun one, is to get trains all around. So I was in Geneva last night, now I'm in Zurich, and uh, at nine o'clock this evening I get a night train to Budapest. So um, forgive me if you hear some train announcements during this podcast. If you hear the nine o'clock to Budapest, do let me know because I need to be on that. But hopefully I've got a few hours before, before it sets sets off towards good best and lawrence absolutely loves a night train before covid lawrence used to do this a lot so i'm glad i'm glad you've finally got i'm finally like you've finally got that back again that's great Are they I comfortable? A bit of a, uh yeah, well surprisingly yes i mean you have to accept that during the night you're going to get shunted one way and the other so you will wake up but i'm quite a deep sleeper so i can sleep in pretty much any situation uh and no, it's quite nice you get your own little compartment uh you go to sleep in one country i'll go to sleep in switzerland i think the route then takes me all the way across Austria. I'll probably wake up somewhere in Austria, uh, in the mountains, and then it's onto the flats all the way through Hungary to Budapest. So I like it. It's a kind of more relaxed way of traveling. It's a good way to get work done as you go. And at the moment, airports are just a horrendous place to be, especially British ones. So the other option was to fly back to London and then fly down to Budapest. But this just seemed like more fun. Uh, it certainly seems like more fun. Just so you know, American uh, airports are a disaster right now as well. So safe travels getting there. Uh, we can't wait for the weekend. But remember, if you're watching this video on YouTube, like it, subscribe for to ESPN for more F1 content, leave us a comment of what you like, what you don't like, if you have any questions for Lawrence or Nate, and we'll get to it in future episodes. All right, it's time to get down to business. Lawrence, I don't want to call you out, but you warned that this past Grand Prix in France could have been a boring one. And I think the race gods heard you because we did not get a boring race whatsoever what did you guys think of it nate we'll start with you yeah it was it was a lot more dramatic than maybe a french grand prix um i mean it was all down to the charles leclerc crash wasn't it that kind of spun it all around it made the fight at the front actually pretty dull i think that would have been one of the best battles of the season actually with max on a different strategy ferrari kind of changing things up so I don't know. It, it felt like a race that wasn't, you know, it felt like a race that we didn't see. But uh, Russell and Perez made that a lot of fun at the end. I really enjoyed seeing that. Um, and yeah, I think um, Carlos coming back through the field was pretty fun. And as we're going to talk about, pretty dramatic in how that played out on TV. So not the greatest race ever. And I was kind of I was kind of the first time ever. I was kind of wishing a French Grand Prix had played out as normal uh, instead of <laughs> instead of having something dramatic at the front. Yeah, we could have had a really good race. This is the thing. I mean, Leclerc spinning off was a big headline generator. It's obviously a big story. Plenty to follow up on there. But there's two massive downsides, of course. It's kind of killed the championship and we're only halfway through. And secondly, that was shaping up to be a brilliant finale to the race because Leclerc was going to go a little bit longer, which meant that he probably would have dropped behind Verstappen when he pitted. But then he would have had fresher tyres and he would have been able to attack and to get a little bit geeky. But what would have made it even more exciting is that the Red Bull and the Ferrari were generating their lap time in completely different ways. So the Ferrari, it was all in the corners. The Red Bull, it was mainly on the straight. So Leclerc may have tried an overtake in those final few corners, like we saw Sainz do on Perez. You know, that kind of thing was on the cards and it would have been a fantastic way to decide a race. 
unfortunately, what we got instead was Leclerc spinning off, and that was how the race was decided. But it was good. It was action-packed. I did enjoy it, but I do feel it could have been quite a bit better as well. Better. Absolutely. We have, yeah, go ahead. We haven't seen uh, Leclerc and Verstappen go wheel-to-wheel -wheel for a while either. You know, we kind of we got a bit spoilt last year seeing Max and Lewis go to – it seemed like every – few races they were doing it so i was really relishing that obviously they had that at the beginning when max was close so that was a shame hopefully we get you know hopefully we get to see that pretty soon whether it's this weekend or not we'll see but yeah hopefully we hope the french grand prix ended like this you had max verstappen take the checkered flag lewis hamilton in p2 george russell right behind him in p3 sergio perez p4 and carlos sign so you guys have mentioned Charles spinning off and it felt like that was kind of the biggest headline because it could have been an incredible race between those first two. What did you guys make of the mistake that he made? Well, unfortunately, these mistakes do happen with Charles Leclerc. We've seen it throughout his career and in previous years, he didn't really have a car capable of fighting for the championship. So in some ways it was forgivable that he was putting absolutely everything on the line to try and win. But this time, you know, the championship's on the line, the race win was on the line. And really, when you're up against someone as good as Max Verstappen, if you look at Max's championship year last year, it's really hard to find a single mistake in there. And that's what you need to do to get a championship together. And at the moment, the clerks on two mistakes in 12 races, there was a spin in Imola uh, where he spun out of third position and dropped seven points effectively in the championship. And now he's dropped 25. And after the race, he said, look, if I carry on like this, I don't deserve to be world champion. And also, he said, if he loses the championship by 32 points, he can point exactly to where those points got lost. And that will be entirely on him. So we know that Ferrari have given him problems so far this year, both reliability issues and strategy issues. And of course, that must have put a bit of extra pressure on him to perform, to go for victories like he was going for in France. But at the same time, you know, he cannot afford to be making these mistakes and really... I think that's the kind of thing that is going to decide the championship, arguably already has decided the championship. Yeah, it was absolutely gut-wrenching to see that because I agree with Lawrence, like it, it feels like the championships. I mean, there's still enough time left for things to turn around, but Lawrence is completely right. With Max Verstappen, like, is he really going to drop the ball that many times? Are Red Bull going to drop the ball that many times? And um, I think that the most depressing thing is that I think the championship order is the wrong way around. To You know, if this was, if this was Leclerc leading by this much and Verstappen behind, I'd still back them to be going to the final race of the season because Red Bull and Verstappen, they're the perfect package, really. And Ferrari, you know, kind of in every area, kind of lacking every so often. So, yeah, it's it was just seeing that happen. I was like, I couldn't believe it. And for a driver to spin off on their own in, in the dry, in the lead, I mean, that's almost unheard of. That, you know, Vettel did it a few years ago in, in the rain in Germany, uh, which was also Ferrari and also felt like a Ferrari driver letting a championship slip, slip through his fingers. Um, so maybe if you're not in a Ferrari car, it's difficult to do. But yeah, just absolutely horrible to see. I think that was, and we've said this before this season, that though was the most painful radio message I think that we have yep. heard all season. Now I will say this, for a young driver, I feel like a lot of times you see some not want to shoulder the responsibility and point the finger elsewhere. To his credit, afterwards, when we got to hear from him, he's raising his hand saying, that's on me. It's my mistake. I have to be better. And to your point, Lawrence, if I'm not better in these situations, I don't deserve to win a championship. So I thought that that was a little bit refreshing. I don't know what you guys thought about kind of his approach to it, but I, I thought that he was very mature in what he had to say afterwards. Yeah, Charles has always been like that, actually. Um, I referenced the uh, backing mistake that he made a couple of years ago in qualifying and he hit the barriers and he immediately opened the radio channel and said, I am stupid. I am stupid. And he does, you know, he is quite open about the mistakes he makes. And he's also quite open about how he goes about trying to get over it. But I was talking to some people in the media center after the race and one of them pointed out, you'd never hear Max or Lewis make that kind of comment. You know, mm -hmm. they, they would never kind of put themselves down like that openly in the media. They may well think it behind closed doors. But then somebody else made the point, well, Lewis and Max don't really make mistakes like that. So that's the other side to it. So these are it's a clear weakness of Charles. And, you know, it's it's a tricky one because he's also an incredibly fast driver. And arguably, to get to the levels that he gets to, to put in the qualifying lap times that he puts in, he has to take certain risks. And those risks will sometimes not pay off. So really, I think um, with him to be the more rounded driver, it's, it's a little bit more of that risk assessment. He didn't actually have to be pushed to push that hard at that point in the race if he wanted to maintain track position over max sure but ferrari's strategy and they've said this since 
it was actually fine. We can see the position, but we get the fresher tyres for the end of the race, like I said earlier, to go and push and to try and overtake Max. So it's a real balance with, with Charles, and I feel like he hasn't quite found it yet. Yeah, it's so true as well, isn't it, about Lewis and Max? I mean, I actually went back through yesterday and just looked through last season. I was like, I'm trying to find big mistakes they made. And I think each of them made one mistake. Mm -hmm. Lewis had that uh, at Imola where he went off and he he kind of got lucky and unlucky in the same point. You know, he went off, got beached in the gravel, which was pretty unlucky. Safety car came out, etc. but was pretty flawless for the rest of the season. The only time Max did anything was actually that lap in Saudi in qualifying when he was already third on the grid, was pushing, pushing, pushing. So, he, But he already had third on the grid. Like he knew that was you know, the best he, he had, he probably didn't have the quickest car there. And he obviously hit the wall just going for it. And other than that, you didn't really see it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's such a good point. And, um, with, with, um, Leclerc, it's so much easier to go through. Like you don't, you, you find yourself stopping like, Oh, there was a mistake here. There was a mistake here. Monaco a few years ago, he had pole and he crashed. So yeah, it is it, at the moment, if you were to compare him with those two guys, that's why I wouldn't personally yet, put him in that kind of top tier with those other two guys that's just just lacking um but yeah he's young like you said katie so hopefully it's something you can kind of you know he can kind of round those edges off in his driving style and and kind of get over that yeah well he wasn't also the the only one who made a mistake uh i think the team at the pit wall also wish they could come uh, get back a decision that they decided to make so in the other ferrari you had carlos signs who started at the back of the grid makes his way all the way up into the top four. Then he suffers a five second penalty. And before that though, what happened between the pit wall and him asking him to pit while he's in the middle of an overtake and the indecision, I just think was incredible to watch on the radio messages. So Nate, what do you think happened there? Yeah, those Ferrari radio messages are just uh, just insane. I mean, I, I, think, I think Ferrari were probably... I think it probably sounded a lot worse than it, it was. I think that those radio messages usually delayed a little bit. So I feel like it was probably in that back straight before the chicane. But he, but Ferrari would have known he was still battling Perez. So while while he probably wasn't going wheel to wheel with Perez, they would have known their drivers there. I mean, they should have been communicating like, hey, you know, you know, we can see you're battling Perez. They should have been telling him either ease off, you're coming in to pit this lap or keep going, we'll pit you another lap. So I think we've talked about this before, haven't we? That Mercedes and Red Bull, again, we're going to compare Ferrari to the other teams. But their radio comms at those other two teams are a lot more, it just seems like there's a lot more, I guess, clarity, a lot more um, assuredness behind them. Ferrari's just never seemed like that. And yeah, you know, he had Carlos at one point. I mean, it was a slip of the tongue, but they said, you've got a five second stop go penalty. And he's like, no, no, it's just five seconds at the end of the pit. And you're just like, why is it always Ferrari that has these messages? You know, it's, n it's never another team that has these messages where a driver's correcting them. I mean, Science and Silverstone had, um, he was like, stop making it. I can't remember the exact, quote now but it was like you're making things up or something like that and it's just just bizarre so I think at the time it sounded like Sainz was pretty confused with it I mean he he's stepped out of the car twice during that weekend and said our strategy calls have actually been better than people have given us credit for I'm not sure what Lawrence thinks about that but I think that was you know it felt like he was just kind of towing the party line there um because they haven't really been great it's been pretty obvious to see that um but yeah just just pretty poor all around I think that Ferrari probably made in hindsight, a decent call because you, you know, he had that penalty, but it just seemed like they could, you know, if they'd kept him out, there could be a safety car. He could have pitted for fresh tires. There was that virtual safety car later that, you know, that if it stayed out, he could have, he could have benefited from. So I don't know. It did just seem like they were, they were kind of making up as they went along from what we heard. And then of course they gave him like just after Leclerc crash, they pit him, bring him out and they get an unsafe release penalty. So it was just kind of a classic day of Ferrari just doing everything. And if you were watching for the first time, you must have thought, is this the Ferrari that everyone talks about being the greatest team in F1? Like, I don't see it myself. I just don't see it. So they don't do themselves any favours, sadly. Lawrence, do you think that their team strategy has been better than maybe we've given them credit for? No, I think it has yeah. been a weakness throughout the year. Uh, Monaco, they managed to shuffle Leclerc from a race lead down to fourth. Mm -hmm. uh, in at Silverstone, they could have double stacked their cars um, in the pit stop and therefore, you know, held on to what would have uh, likely been a one two. They didn't. They only gave science the tire advantage. He went on to win the race, but Leclerc again got shuffled backwards. So there's two examples, I think, where the strategy really was lacking. The strange thing about the French one was uh, not so much the decision to pit because they actually had to pit they've they've since explained this there's a number of things one yes that radio call they said was in turn 10 which is seen so it's just after the long straight and that high speed right hander 
Science overruled that because he wanted to get past Perez. To be honest, Science shouldn't have overruled that. He should have pitted because uh, that made sense. But really what they should have done is pitted several laps earlier because as soon as they pitted under the safety car, uh, they had to do 35 laps to the end. And their data was telling them that the medium tyre, which Science had to be put onto because you have to use both compounds in the race, could only do 25 laps. So there was this 10 laps that they were always not going to be able to do at the end on those tyres. But given that knowledge, they probably should have pitted him earlier. Sure, he would have dropped back a long way because he had the five second penalty, which he would have served at the pit stop, as well as the pit stop itself, which is very slow in France compared to other tracks. So you lose a lot of time. So yes, he would have dropped right down the order, probably as low as 13th or so. But on those new tyres, he would have been able to fight back. Realistically, could he have got a better result? Like maybe, maybe he would have pushed for, for fourth. But I think, you know, they would have absolutely had to nail the timing of the pit stop, got a bit lucky with traffic coming back through. So I can see what science is saying. You know, given the result that was on the table, probably there wasn't much they could do. The only other thing they could have done is gamble on uh, their estimation that the tyres would last 25 and just hope they last the extra 10. But then you're dealing with a potential tyre failure, which, of course, is very, very dangerous. And also, in that case, a potential double DNF. Can you imagine if we'd had a situation where Leclerc had put it in the barriers by himself and then Ferrari's strategy had resulted in a tyre failure that then put Sainz in the barrier and then you've got the repair bill on top. So I understand why they did it. I don't think this was the biggest strategy bungle of the year, but it's without doubt the case that it's a weakness of Ferrari compared to Red Bull and Mercedes and it's a big enough weakness to cost championships. You know, it's, I, I, like I said earlier, I can't really see Leclerc getting back into this championship, but if he does, every single strategy call from now on has to be bang on the money. And I just can't see Ferrari doing that based on what we've seen so far this year. I love I love their messages as well because they always seem to have an endless amount of plans, don't they? They're like, right, it's plan F now, plan G. And you're like, how many, how many scenarios are you discussing before the race? Like I'm I'm sure there are loads, but just like again, they're the only team that seem to have this long list of them. I can't can't get my head around it. So maybe and if I, I can barely remember two plans, you know, if I'm going into work. So if you're driving an F1 car, you're like, right, plan F, which one was that? I can't quite remember now. Like, so maybe, maybe there's something there as well. Who knows? Yeah, sadly, they they did enough this weekend to get us to lead the show with it and not Max Verstappen and Red Bull, who actually won the race. So Max Verstappen has been so consistent as you guys see every single weekend, another victory, the second straight victory at Paul Ricard. Uh, Checo, unfortunately, maybe not his best performance. Not sure how he felt after the race. What did you make of Red Bull's weekend? Max was flawless, absolutely flawless, as you say. And really, we do need to highlight when he's driving that way. The fact that Red Bull pitted him early, it was a risky strategy because he then would have had to go to the very end of the race on hard tyres, having pitted on lap 16. That was a huge distance to go. He would have had to manage them really carefully. He had to do that anyway, but of course he had no pressure from the clerk after the clerk spun up. So Max drove a very good race. It would have been very interesting to see how he would have dealt with Leclerc had he stayed in the race, but it was very good. Checo, it was, it was really one of those weekends where he went missing. In fact, the surprise was how good he was in qualifying because with Checo, usually it's the other way around. He's off the pace in qualifying and he's on the pace in the race, but it's something that he wanted to address this year and clearly he has, but maybe it's leaving some weaknesses elsewhere in, in the race because that Red Bull, if you look at how easy Max had it at the front, again, like I said, on a fairly compromised strategy by pitting so early, Lewis never even got close or was a threat to, uh, to, to Max. So for Checo to lose that place to George Russell, I know it happened under the weird virtual safety car ending, but still to lose that position or even be in a position where he might lose that and also not to challenge Lewis for second place wasn't really good enough. But um, we've seen this with Checo before. And then sometimes he comes back and he puts in a great performance. But it is strange how at one stage this year, he almost looked like a title contender, didn't he? You know, mm -hmm. we think of Monaco, that, you know, brilliant performance to go and win the race. Spain, where arguably, had he been allowed to fight Max, he would have given him a run for his money, potentially beaten him. Yet now it's just completely gone. And yeah, it's, it's one of those frustrations with, with Perez that, you know, he just can't quite get the consistency there. The problem is he's going up against one of the highest ben benchmarks in their form, which is Max Verstappen. And I think ultimately that's the issue he faces. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think I, I really rate Perez and I know Lawrence does too. And I think it's similar to the situation you had with Bottas almost with Mercedes. You've got very, very competent driver, very, very quick driver. But that is exactly the point is both those guys went up against, you know, generational talents. 
And you often hear, and, and I'm sure Verstappen will get it in a few years if he keeps winning. People say, oh, he's only, you know, he's winning, he's in the best car. It's like to win in the best car. I mean, and Charles is a great example. You know, Charles spun out in in, a, in the quickest car of the race mm-hmm. and didn't finish. To, to, to win and to be at that level every single weekend. I mean, I think there's a reason that Verstappen, since Ricardo left, there's been all those teammates that have c- come up to Red Bull and have just not been able to compete. I think mentally, he must be so difficult to be a teammate of. You've got the same machinery and he's just he's just out there doing you know incredible things with the car like Lewis was with Mercedes. We saw what happened with Bottas and I've actually, for that reason, been pretty impressed with how Georgia started uh, at Mercedes. But yeah, it's it definitely, it was pretty deflating because I, I was fully on the Perez bandwagon a few weeks ago. I was like, let's go, you know, Perez championship. But yeah, he just, you know, he's lacking in some of those big moments. And you think back to Spain this year, Mm-hmm. When they swap positions, I think Red Bull have always kind of known that. I don't think they've ever thought we're going to have two cars here equally fighting for the for the championship. And I don't think that's a knock on Checo. I just think it's reality of how good Max is. So, um, yeah, but uh, it's a shame. But I think I think you know as a as a number two driver, quote unquote, probably one of the best there is. But I think that's probably all he's going to be. I think he'll win. Obviously, he'll win a handful more races, probably. But yeah, I think that's kind of what you've got to expect with Checo is just that kind of roller coaster up and down. You mentioned Mercedes. From the lowest of lows to the highest of highs, they finally get their first double podium of the 2022 season. Lawrence, just take us through the weekend for Mercedes, because maybe it wasn't as promising starting out. Yeah, I think mixed feelings even after the checkered flag for Mercedes. Okay, it was their best result of the year, but the performance wasn't there. And this was the track that they were looking at in terms of layout, smooth tarmac, which we know the Mercedes needs to be able to run low and generate performance from the floor without porpoising and bouncing and having all the problems that we've seen at other races. And yet the performance wasn't there. They were 0.9 seconds off in in qualifying. That's a gap that, you know, they were having when they were really struggling with all those issues I just mentioned. So I think they were uh, they were happy, of course, to have two cars on the podium, but they were disappointed with where their performance was. And it came after a weekend with a couple of upgrades as well. You know, they had um, some small changes to the floor, not as dramatic as the Silverstone upgrade, which they felt unlocked quite a lot of performance, but still not uh, not, not what they wanted. So, yeah, it's, it's a funny one. So good result. Nice to get the two trophies to go back to Brackley with for them, I'm sure. But they leave there thinking, ah, oh, we thought our car was a bit quicker than this. George, George's performance um, was interesting. Right. There was a moment where he thought that um, Checo went outside, came back in front of him and that he should have to concede the position. He's all over the radio about it. You rarely hear a team principal actually get on the comms because it's a team engineer that's usually speaking to these drivers. You hear the voice of Toto Wolf, not once, but twice. And he essentially tells him, keep your head down, let it go. You got this guy. His tires are supposed to wear or starting to wear. Uh, and finally, he regains the position and he finishes on the podium. What did you think of the way that George finished it? Yeah, uh, that must be quite a daunting voice to hear on the radio, right? Toto Wolf. I mean, you know, those guys, obviously, they know him so well. But mm-hmm. you're right. We don't really hear that that often. I was really impressed. I thought Russell, I think Russell's been fantastic all year. You know, it's really hard to poke holes in his performances. I think Lewis has got on top of the car and seems to be a bit quicker now. But to be as close as he is to Lewis is still is still pretty impressive. Um, and yeah, uh, so I, I so I missed the French Grand Prix. Lawrence went out there. I, I went to a friend's wedding, but I got back in time to watch the coverage here. And on Sky after the race, um, Toto Wolf was talking on on Sky, and he was talking to Nico Rosberg, who of course used to be a Mercedes driver. And he joked to, to Rosberg. He said, "Sometimes you needed that same treatment of me getting in your ear and just calming you down, and just kind of getting you back on track." And he said, "Because sometimes these drivers get so carried away in their heads. You know, Russell was shouting, I was ahead, I was ahead, I was ahead,' and they said, no." like you weren't the replays showed you you weren't like get on with it and i think it, it it's a it's a real credit to, to russell that he responded the way he did but i think it, it's a reminder isn't it that you've got a younger driver in the car there a guy who is still chasing all of those career accolades you know he wants his first win he wants his first pole position all this stuff um and yeah wolf just getting on the radio and saying you know like you said katie you've got this you know this is you're fine just just calm it down um so yeah, really interesting, and I think we, we forget when we see these team team principals. They're obviously bosses of teams, but they're also you know they're man managers as well. They they manage these drivers day to day, and they get to know them so intimately. You know that that same treatment might not work with Lewis. You know maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. But I think it was interesting that Toto felt that kind of thing would work with Russell and calm him down. Um, and yeah, he drove really well. And I think that 
a lot of these younger drivers, it's 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 actually really interesting how the teams deal with all of them. And and Russell sometimes it does seem like he needs just to be told, no, it's fine, you know, put that to the back of your head, get on with it. And we know he's quick enough to, you know, to put in the results that he did. So yeah, I was really impressed with him. And in a race like that, it's easy to overlook him, but I thought he did, I thought he did really well. I thought that moment kind of peeled back an onion, right? Where these guys are young and mm. they need that help at some point. Max Verstappen maybe drives at his best when he's angry or fixated on something, but not everybody is like that. And so I thought that that was very telling that, you know, George was able to regain his composure and then also get a result. Yeah. And, and on Toto, I mean, the only time we've really heard him talk to Lewis during Grand Prix has been after them earlier in the season when he was basically apologizing, you know, he used some choice words to describe their car, but you never, I can't remember the last time he spoke to Lewis in the race. And I think that's an age thing. I think that just shows Lewis's role in the team. Um, but I can remember in Bahrain in 2014, they 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 had some pretty serious messages when it was Hamilton and Rosberg had that great fight wheel to wheel. Mm-hmm. That senior management come on and say, look, just bring these cars home. OK, you can do what you want, but bring the cars home. So you do see it occasionally. And I think that it, it was quite a significant intervention. All right. So we just hit the top five. Rounding out the top 10 was Fernando Alonso, P6, Lando Norris, Esteban Ocon, Daniel Ricciardo, and then Lance Stroll finished in 10. So. Fernando Alonso had an excellent drive this weekend, broke the record for most laps by an F1 driver. Alpine has passed McLaren in the Contractors Championship as Ocon also finished above Ricardo. So is it official, Lawrence? Can we say that Alpine is officially the fourth best team in Formula One right now? I still on the evidence of the last few races, that's the case. Um, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because Daniel Ricardo hasn't been performing as well as he should. So if you were to double Lando Norris's uh, points tally, then you'd, you'd pop them up a bit. But equally, Fernando's had some bad luck earlier this year, so it probably isn't on the points that you'd expect from him. So the honest answer is it's close. It's close. And, you know, it, it, it's a good... I like when we get these battles further down the grid. They sometimes get overlooked a bit behind the championship battles. But, you know, there's big money on the line for this because whoever finishes ahead in the Constructors' Championship gets, you know, several millions uh, more uh, for that position. So... Yeah, it's close. Uh, and I think it will change circuit to circuit. So just because it was that way in France doesn't mean it'll be that way in Budapest. But again, that's what makes Formula 1 interesting and exciting to watch is that uh, a lot of the battles further down the field can yo-yo and move around. Plus, there were a number of teams that definitely underperformed this weekend. So uh, I think we'll see the likes of Haas and Alpha Tauri get back in there as well. I think I, I owe Pierre Gasly uh, an apology because maybe I jinxed him. I said he was going to have a great race. And then Alpha Tauri, as you mentioned had upgrades, but then had an awful weekend. So any drivers of note from the weekend that really stood out to you for great performances, good performances, even poor performances? Well, you you mentioned him. We don't often talk about him. I think he can divide opinion, but it's it's, it's quite interesting. Lance Stroll finishing 10th. I think sometimes, obviously that car at the moment isn't isn't great for Aston, but he's Mm -hmm. quite good at doing these, you know, he does these really long stints on tyres sometimes that really put him into positions. It was interesting right at the end of that race. I don't know if, if... all of our listeners saw the replays, but he and Vettel very nearly didn't finish that race. There was some some suspect defending right there at the end. But you get the impression that at Aston, that was quite an important point for him. You know, he's had quite a difficult season. There's quite an interesting interview with him on Sky afterwards where he was just like, it was, you know, pretty big relief and stuff like that. Not saying it was the greatest performance of the weekend, but it was, you know, I think Stroll often gets overlooked and gets negatively talked about, you know, and I've criticized him before. I know, I know, you know, he's he's been, been at the back end of the field, but that was a pretty good point for Aston. Um and yeah, the Ricardo, the Ricardo question was interesting. I wonder what Lawrence thinks about it, but he looked like he was in a better position, but I still didn't see anything that suggested to me that he's made huge improvements. I think the fact that he was in that fight with Alpine, that's a start, you know, but um, yeah, it, it seemed like maybe he's still lacking a little bit of confidence somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, because the other thing to remember about that battle was uh, Ocon got the penalty early on as well. So, you know, he... He was taking the fight to Lando and I think had a faster car than Lando, but had naturally been knocked, knocked back a bit. And Ricardo just couldn't, couldn't keep himself in that fight and admitted that afterwards. I think, you know, it's always good when you're struggling as a driver to get some points on the board. He did that. But um, the actual performance relative to his teammate still wasn't where he wants it to be. Um, the other team which kind of went missing over the weekend was Haas. And there's a couple of reasons for that, really. And most of it is based on qualifying. Um the uh, engine penalty that Kevin Magnussen had dropped into the back of the grid. He actually made it to Q3. You know, that car mm-hmm. was quick around there, so he got that high. Mick probably would have gone high as well, Mick Schumacher, but he cut a corner on his Q1 lap, which meant that that 
uh, lap was deleted and he therefore didn't make it through to Q2. So, yeah, it's 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 close, you know, um, and those are the small margins in that midfield yeah. battle at the moment that are incredibly costly. Uh, you know, they can they can be the difference between getting two cars in the points and having no cars in the points and going home without it and dropping further back in that battle. So, again, just as we were saying at the, at the front of the grid that the drivers need to be on it all the time, uh, not make any mistakes, it's exactly the same all the way down because it's just that competitive in, in the midfield. As always, excellent analysis on the race that was. We put a bow on the French Grand Prix. Now let's look ahead to this weekend. So Lawrence is on his way to Hungary this weekend. Nate, you're joining him tomorrow, which will be the final race before the summer break. Uh, Mattia Bonotto, Ferrari's team principal, has been quoted by saying that Ferrari needs to take a 1-2 victory here at the Hungaro ring. Lawrence, do you feel like that's a realistic expectation after what we just saw in France? I think in terms of car performance, sure. Um, you know, the car was quick enough to win in France and a track like Hungary actually should suit the Ferrari more based on what we've seen trends over the year. Uh, it's a very much a low speed corner. People often say it's like Monaco without the barriers. Well, you know, it's Charles Clerk who was on pole in Monaco and really should have won that race. And so, yes, they should be quick enough. But again, you know, do we trust them not to make any mistakes, both from the driver side and from the pitbull side uh, and the reliability side, which has been an issue throughout? So, yeah, that that's the big question. But do they have the performance to win in Hungary? I believe they do. So take me behind the scenes a little bit, and and I don't want to be super negative, but we have talked about strategy and the poor strategy that Ferrari has had in the past. Will we see a personnel change on the pit wall? Do we see that often in F1, Nate? It does from time to time. I mean, what we saw more with when Mercedes was dominating, when they would have issues like this, they would change the procedures rather than the people. And sometimes they'd change the people around, but they were pretty good at looking at okay, how did this decision get made? How can we do it better? Um, is there something currently in our in our system, in our procedure that is holding us back? And then they would make that call. Um, and you do see teams shuffling things around. I mean, sometimes they'll say, you know, this guy's gone from this side of the garage to this side or whatever, which, you know, can be controversial in itself with those drivers. Um, but it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell if if, if the issue is is procedural or if it's, if it's people at Ferrari. And I think it might be a bit of both. I think that... Um, you know, it's always difficult to tell, isn't it, when you're not there in the team, but you can tell from the outside that there is something wrong. But um, I would be surprised if after everything they've had this year, there haven't been some changes to the procedures. And I think I think a lot of Ferrari fans would take comfort in Ferrari making some personnel changes of some sort, even if it's just moving people around a little bit and just saying, right, we're going to have fresh input into these roles, maybe switch up the way we do things. But it's not it's not quite as common as, say, you know, an NFL team dropping their defensive coordinator. You don't hear that all the time. But it does happen, and maybe it doesn't make as much news as it does elsewhere. But um, I can't remember the last major one of, of that happening on the on the back of a mistake or on the back of a few mistakes. Um, but Lawrence's memory is always better better than mine at that. But uh, I can't remember any. Yeah, and I think maybe just changing the dynamic could be helpful uh, for the team at this point. So when you look at the track, Lawrence, does this track favor Ferrari or Red Bull? Yeah, I reckon it's um, it's more of a Ferrari track, but. You know, we've been wrong about this before. Often things like the way the, the asphalt itself, you know, whether it's got big gaps between the little bits of stone or small gaps can make a huge difference in terms of tyre performance. The bumps, you know, we've been talking about bumps all year because it has this real impact on the way these cars are set up. Uh, so we do get surprises still. But I would say, yeah, it's it looks on paper more like a track that will suit this year's Ferrari over the Red Bull, mainly because Red Bull's performance advances usually comes on the straights and there's only one straight in Budapest really and uh, it's not a particularly long one by F1 standards. So Nate, where do you feel like Red Bull can maybe find an edge this weekend? Well, I think we've talked about him already, but you know, the Verstappen factor is huge there and you know, he's, I mean, he's, he's quick wherever he goes. I think the Hungarian is an interesting place because Lawrence is absolutely right. You know, there's only one real straight, but we do see a fair amount of overtaking. DRS there can sometimes be pretty powerful and you get some interesting battles into turn one. And I don't know, I think I think a one-two, honestly, when I heard Bonato say that, I mean, I agree, I think it does sound like a Ferrari track, but it's a pretty bold statement after the way the last few races have gone. But then again, if you look at their pure pace and it shows you just the results they should have been having. So I think for Red Bull, uh, you know, it's kind of in max we trust. That's That's got to be the motto there because I think he can make a lot of differences with just the way he drives. Um, 
yeah, we'll see. I mean, yeah, I think it's going to be difficult for him to to kind of power past the Ferraris like he might have done at other other venues. But again, when you've got Max in the car, I think it I think it's it becomes easier to dictate some strategies. And and who knows if he can if he can qualify ahead of one of those Ferraris, it suddenly then becomes quite interesting, doesn't it? You know, he can they can play around with the strategy a bit more. They can try and undercut one guy or overcut another guy. So um, yeah, I think with Max in the car, he just makes those those options a lot easier. Mercedes has clearly been building and building and building every single week, tinkering, tinkering, making some changes, trying to figure this car out. Obviously, the results in France was very, very promising. Lawrence, do we feel like we're finally at, at a place where they're going to continuously challenge each weekend? Um, I think there's still a little bit in no man's land. Again, it's just it's just the performance versus the results. You know, the one thing they've really got going for them, I think, is that uh, reliability wise, the car seems pretty bulletproof. It keeps finishing races. Uh, the only one I think of top of my head at the moment was uh, Russell when he um, spun off uh, or, you know, got taken out uh, at the start of the British Grand Prix. So they've got a real solid basis of a car there. Um, the question is is whether they, they can close that gap. And again, if we're talking about on paper, what do we think about Budapest and will it suit Mercedes? Probably not. But then we said that about Austria, and that was one of the races where performance-wise they were that bit closer. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they can surprise us from time to time. But I think at the moment it really is just a case of, you know, understanding where that performance went in France, perhaps making some changes and, and, and trying to pull it back. But it's a big ask. Nine-tenths of a second in qualifying is huge in Formula 1 terms. So that is a massive gap to overcome. And it's not the kind of thing that I think uh, they'll find just from one weekend to the next. Outside of the top three teams, is there anybody that you think could have a promising result given the track? Quite interested to see what, what Haas can do. So they've released, so they're going to finally finally have that upgrade. We spoke last time about how it's been impressive how they've kept, you know, an unupgraded car kind of relevant in the midfield. Kevin Magnussen is going to be running that car. And I think, you know, Lawrence is right. Like they could have had a really great result last time out. Um, yeah, and I think that this this place could suit them as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that package does, especially when you consider you've kind of got that baseline in the midfield of Alpine and McLaren fighting. Haas have always kind of just been, you know, just kind of tucked behind that quite nicely and in that gaggle of cars behind it. But it'll be interesting if there is signs of a real step forward there. Um, you know, it might be too big of an ask for them. But yeah, I think I think Magnussen and or Schumacher should be aiming for points this weekend because I think that that is a Haas, that car is a car that should be doing that uh, all the time. Yeah, important to mention that the upgrades are only on Magnussen's car. And the yeah. reason for that is um, is that uh, the amount of accidents they've had this year meant that they had to delay building the new parts for uh, for the upgrade because they just had to build replacement parts of the old specifications. So um, they also outsource the building of most of their parts to a company called Delara in Italy. So they don't quite have the same... Um, processes involved that you might expect from a Formula One team to just turn around, churn out pieces. It all has to be done within what Delara are doing on other projects. So, um, yeah, that, that, that'll be interesting how it goes. Uh, but as we saw with Alpha Tauri, and we mentioned it briefly earlier, you can bring this big raft of upgrades to a car, and sometimes it might not necessarily go slower, but you just don't find the performance you're expecting from it because uh, these are science experiments on wheels, you know, and sometimes those experiments go wrong and it doesn't doesn't bring the performance you want. It takes a little while for them to dial it in with sets of changes for the driver to get used to it, maybe change the driving style a bit around it. So um, that will be interesting. But yeah, that Magnus and Schumacher um, uh, kind of comparison will, will, will be interesting, but don't hold it against Schumacher too much if he's... A, you know, a few temps off the pace because he doesn't have the upgraded car. Fair enough. You you mentioned a long straight and just one long straight. Let's dig into the circuit here. So the Hungaro ring is 2.7 miles, 4.4 kilometers for the Europeans. Uh, our, our great English producer always puts that conversion in for me because I certainly can't do it myself. Uh, boasts 14 corners with only one DRS zone. It's a track that many of the drivers have said, guys, resembles a karting track, but I don't necessarily know if that's a good thing for us fans watching at home. Lawrence, you said that last weekend could have been a boring one. There was some drama here and there. What do you think about this one? Well, Budapest for a long time was considered a track where you get dull racing. It, basically, it was too small too difficult to overtake and overtaking undoubtedly is difficult there yeah. but weirdly there's something about um ever since we moved to these turbo hybrid 
engines, and I can't figure out what it would be, but around 2014, it started producing these really, really exciting races. Um, so yeah, I think you always have to go there, maybe expecting the worst, but there's a few things that go on there. One is uh, the heat. Uh, it gets very hot. If you thought France was hot, well, Budapest, um, last weekend, certainly the temperatures were hit 40 degrees or so. That is putting a lot of strain on a Formula One car both the internals, you know, just the reliability of it, but really, especially the tyres and trying to manage that uh, for a race. So that could be an interesting fact. And then the other side to it is that you get this 40 degree heat and the only way that it breaks is with a thunderstorm. So we've had a number of uh, races in recent years where we've had rain either just before the race or just after the start. And it makes for thrilling racing, you know, add water to Formula One and it's usually pretty exciting prospect. So um, I'm going to go on the optimistic side this weekend after being pessimistic about France and we actually got a reasonable race in France and say that we are going to have a good race in Budapest. I appreciate the- that. I appreciate Oh, go ahead, Nate. I was going to say the weather does, the forecast does look like that as well. And it's got rain for both Saturday and Sunday. So it could be a good mix, and but it's definitely hot as well. So there is that good mix there. So I'm fully on board with Lawrence. I, I, Hungary, I always now just predict we're going to have a great race. Always tends to deliver something. Hopefully the power remains on because I think that's what caused part of the delay in Monaco where we're all like, come on, get this race going, even though it's raining. So yes, rain always makes for excitement. As we mentioned, just a couple of places, few places to overtake, uh, especially with some shorter straights. So Nate, what do you think some of the strategy will be for drivers uh, this weekend? Yeah, I think there is really only one proper place, and um, this again, this this is this is where those these mis, uh, mixed up weekends can be quite interesting because if Friday is just hot and there's no rain, a lot of the work they do, if it rains you know later in the weekend, it kind of you know the strategies have to be a lot different to to the work they're doing there. But I don't know. I think tired tired egg. You know, every year you go to a circuit and it's that's the question they're asking themselves on Fridays. But I think that track position here is going to be key. So you don't want to. You don't want to pit yourself early and end up in a bunch of traffic. You know, it's very difficult to get, especially in the middle of that circuit, you know, to get into clean air away from cars. So I can see some drivers trying some really long stints on tires, especially some of those guys further back. Um, but yeah, very difficult to say. I think the rain, the rain, I'm really, you know, banking on some rain on Sunday because I mean, Mercedes might just leave Lewis out on the grid again, like they did last year. <laughs> that was that, that, that was pretty memorable. Um, but yeah, if, if you remember Ocon's win last year, obviously that that rain at the beginning dried up super quickly. Um, again, because of how hot it was, it, it, the conditions almost changed. You know, they changed super, super quick. Um, and then it was basically just a race to the flag. You know, there's the minimal pit stops and, and that was it. So I can see the same happening this year for sure. It's also a track where a lot of the teams will set their cars to maximum downforce for the weekend. Lawrence, can you explain to us what that means? Yeah, so a car, a Formula One car, one of the big trade-offs when you're deciding your setup and, and how you're going to run it is uh, how much wing you run. And essentially, the more wing you run, the more downforce you create, uh, the faster you go around the corners. But you sacrifice um, you sacrifice straight line speed because those big wings also create aerodynamic drag, which slows the car down. So it's a, it's a real trade-off. Uh, but at a place like Budapest, where it's mainly corners, because they, they say it's like a car track because it's corner after corner after corner, and the drivers don't really get to rest until they get on that single straight you can sacrifice a bit of straight line speed because you know you're going to make the lap time back up in, in the corner. So, yeah, they do tend to go with uh, the maximum downforce. And uh, that's another reason why I think it could be a Ferrari track because we've seen that Ferrari uh, find it a lot easier to put downforce onto the car and maintain the performance, whereas uh, part of Red Bull's whole design philosophy has basically been uh, running usually slightly smaller wings, generating downforce from the underfloor of the car, of course, but um, also benefiting from straight line speed. But that strength they have won't deliver the lap time as much in Budapest as they did say in, in full car. All right, if it's a, a Ferrari track, let's get to our predictions, okay? Prediction time. Uh, Lawrence, you were almost accurate. You said that you thought Lewis might get the victory in France. So let's turn to you first. Who do you think is going to win this Hungarian Grand Prix? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I was, I was a bit off with predicting the Mercedes victory. But this weekend, I'm going to stick with everything I've just said. We've been talking about the Hungarian Grand Prix for a little while now. And I keep saying Ferrari. We'll see the Ferrari. So I'm going to say Charles Leclerc to bounce back and get a victory. Because... While Leclerc is error prone, the thing that we've very rarely seen, and this speaks to his mental strength, is him go into a downward spiral and make mistake after mistake after mistake. That's what we saw with Sebastian Vettel in 2018 after that 
Germany mistake that Nate referenced earlier, Hockenheim in the wet. Uh, he then just kind of really spiraled down and couldn't find the performance. I think Charles is actually the opposite. Sometimes he comes back even stronger. He said that after the um, after the French Grand Prix that he just wants to be alone. He wants to go back to his Monaco apartment, mm-hmm. lock the door and think about what he's done. But I think in doing that, he will come back as a stronger driver. And I think that could put him with that car in contention for victory. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, my, my call's good. I know it's I know it's not always the most fun when Lawrence and I just say the same prediction, but I think I mean that's heart and head. You know, I'm, I really think we need to see Leclerc win because if it's Max who wins, we go into the summer break and it's even bigger that championship gap. So it will at least give like a glimmer of hope that there's some some life in the championship. But um, I think I think if we're doing a top three prediction rather than a top, you know, just I think it would be I would say Max and Max second splitting the two Ferraris because I I think that one two. I think it. I think it's optimistic still. Uh, given what you guys have educated me on throughout this episode, I would say that I'm hopeful Ferrari bounces back. But uh, just given their pedigree and the mistakes that I've seen, I'm going to go with Max Verstappen. I think that he gets his ninth victory of the season. I think he gets it done for Red Bull. Uh, Christian Horner says he has been phenomenal and exceeded all expectations this season, uh, and he's been so much fun to watch with consistency. So I'm going to go with Max Verstappen. We, of course, will see who's right, who's wrong once we break down Budapest and the Hungarian Grand Prix when we come back next week. That'll do it, guys, for another episode here on Unlapped. I hope you both travel safe to Budapest. Uh, Enjoy the weekend. You know, we'll be paying close attention here in the United States. It's the last race weekend before you guys and the entire teams get to take a summer break. And, you know, as we said, Ferrari, hoping they can keep this title race alive. Max Verstappen going for his ninth victory. We'll find out on at 9 a.m. Sunday morning on ESPN. And we'll be back next week to recap all the action. Remember, like this video and subscribe to ESPN for more F1 content. Leave us comments on what you like, what you didn't like. If you have any questions for Nate or Lawrence. And if you're listening on this episode, give us a five-star rating. It helps other fans find out more about our content. Until next week, Katie George, Lawrence Edmondson, Nate Saunders. Thank you so much, guys. Cheers. Cheers.